mostly domestic labor. Um, and so we have uh, records of a young woman named uh, Liza Rickard who went to, uh, to work as a servant uh, in the early 20th century in Bromptonville in the home of a member of parliament named uh, E.W. E, e. Tobin. Um, and so we have these little fragments of history that um, sometimes uh, don't give us a sense of um, what the bigger picture looked like, but we, we are able to start to get a sense that there were, uh, there were people here, there were black people here in the townships and they experienced this place and they had uh, certain condition, conditions of living that were very different from their white counterparts. Um, and so we go into a little bit in, in our exhibit uh, about the history of these women of Guadeloupe and uh, the case of Eliza Rickard in Bromptonville. Um, in my, um, kind of search for the Black ar Archive uh, in the Eastern Townships, I initially uh, contacted over uh, at least 20 or 25 archives from around the townships to discover whether uh, they had uh, any material uh, pertaining to, to Black histories in this region. And perhaps unsurpri or unsurprisingly, um, there were very, very, very few archives that had any records related to Black life in the region. Um, and this is not necessarily because there, uh, there was no Black life in the region, but rather because a lot of their stories were not recorded in official archives, um, were not always counted as official or important history uh, worthy of preservation. And so uh, we do have a few um, interesting pieces that come to us through in the form of uh, journal articles. And we have one photograph um, that's quite a precious uh, piece actually in our archive of, of Black history of the townships. It comes to us from uh, the Archive Boisfran in Victoriaville of a domestic servant named Martha. Um, and the photo uh, would have been taken, it looks like it would have been taken in, in the early, early 20th centuries, perhaps the 1920s. Uh, it's possible, at least I speculate, she could have been uh, one of the women Women from Guadeloupe, but we don't know this for certainty because um, that's we the only information that we have about this woman is what she was wearing in the photo, uh, which was she was um, wearing Victorian garb, um, and her name, which was Martha. Um, beyond. Uh, Beyond uh, contacting archives in the townships, uh, another methodology I used in my research uh, was looking at the records of um, newspapers and specifically the Sherbrooke record. And um, it it's it's actually quite productive uh, to look at the to look at the archives of the Sherbrooke record uh, because we have a lot of that that's been preserved and it's searchable by term which makes doing research on it um, really, really uh, easy compared to doing research on certain uh, physical archives that haven't been digitized and aren't, aren't yet searchable by term. Um, and uh, what I learned, uh, I, feel, I learned a few things. I think, think there's a lot more research to be done on, um, on the Sherbrooke Record archives. Um, but a few things that I learned about were the really big, um, uh, prevalence of blackface minstrel performances in the townships in the early 20th centuries, in, in the early 20th century, sorry, um, at uh, events um, like local carnivals and fancy dress masquerades. Um, and it was also a really popular uh, activity for Boy Scouts uh, in the townships. And for those of you who aren't familiar with what blackface minstrelsy is, um, it's a uh, it's a phenomenon, it was a performance form that was wildly popular in the late 19th and early 20th centuries um, across North America. And it involved usually white performers uh, blacking up their faces with burnt cork and performing um, caricatures, stereotypical caricatures of black people. Um, and so we see that this was uh, a wildly popular performance form uh, across North America, in, including, the early, including the Eastern Townships in the early 20th century. 
Um, and we see these performances is happening in, in Drummondville and in Compton and Lenoxville and uh, Danville and Waterville and Ascot Corner and um, all, so many little, little stages across the Eastern Townships. And this, um, while, is, while it's not an example of the presence of Black people in Eastern Townships, it's certainly an example of uh, what I'm calling the racial imaginary of the Eastern Townships, or the imaginary through which, or the lens through which, um, uh, race gets imagined in certain places in the world. And uh, certainly this varies from place to place. Um, so I'm curious to see how race has been imagined in Eastern townships over time. And that's part of, uh, that's part of uh, the focus of this uh, Black Histories project. Um, beyond uh, Blackface minstrel performances and its, uh, its popularity in the 20th century in the townships, um, looking at the archives of uh, the Sherbrooke record also teaches us a lot about how popular jazz was in the early 20th century and the 1920s in particular, the jazz era. Um, and then again in the 1950s when we see a jazz revival in the, in the Eastern townships. And so we had a lot of uh, black jazz performers coming through the Eastern townships in the 1920s, um, many of them from Montreal, but also possibly up from um, the border to the South uh, doing touring performances. And we see in both the English and French newspapers at the time, um, a real uh, appetite for uh, real jazz music. Um, and there was also an appetite for jazz dancing. And there was e even a dance academy that opened on uh, King Street in Montreal that, uh, that uh, promised to um, educate its pupils in the style of, of uh, black jazz uh, dancing. Um, then again, uh, so, and then this, we get this revival in the 1950s. So even we get like really, really big jazz names like uh, Louis, uh, Louis Metcalf and his international jazz band actually uh, become the openers for the first uh, commercial exposition in Sherbrooke um, in 1949. Um, and so it's really kind of amazing to see the kind of world-class uh, jazz performers that circulated through the townships at different moments in time and the real um, fascination and interest that townships audiences had for jazz music. Um, what else do I want to say? Uh, I, I don't want to go on for too, too long because I would like to uh, leave, question, leave time for question and discussion. But um, I, I'll note a few other punctual moments uh, in, the, in the Black history of the Eastern Township. So one is uh, the presence of Black athletes uh, in the Eastern Townships in the 1950s and 60s in particular. Um, one of the contributors to the exhibit, Andy Holman, who's a professor, a professor, a history professor at Bridgewater State University, uh, has contributed a text about uh, black uh, black uh, hockey players uh, who uh, were playing in Sherbrooke uh, in the 1950s, and he's also done work on uh, the boxers that would come through Sherbrooke uh, in, during this period in time. And so this was um, uh, Holman is writing about. Uh, athletic spaces and athletic uh, competitions as arenas in which, yes, um, you know, sport was happening and the performance of athletic uh, excellence was happening or athletic virtuosity was happening. But he also writes about these spaces as arenas in which ideas about race were being formulated. Um, and uh, a lot of these uh, male athletes were um, uh, performing their black blackness or finding themselves having to perform their blackness in specific ways uh, for townships audiences. So it's a really interesting uh, lens through which Holman is looking at uh, black athleticism in the Eastern townships, which I invite you to, 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 to have a look at in the exhibit. Um, what else would I like to know? Um, another part, another component. Okay, so there are two more uh, kind of main things that I'd like to focus on, um, and then uh, wrap up and open uh, for discussion and uh, regarding this exhibit. So one of the things that was important to me with this exhibit was um, to to look at the connections between 
um, the historical past of the Eastern townships and specifically the black past of the townships and the black presence, uh, present of the townships and the current realities. And so I spent a fair bit of time uh, talking uh, with and meeting with uh, local uh, members of the local black communities in the region and uh, specifically artists and activists, black activists who have been doing really interesting and vibrant and growing uh, work in the region. I was actually just at an event last night. Um, there was a closing uh, closing event uh, for a, a black activist group called Black Estrie. Um, they were uh, just closing their season of programming, a really amazing series of pro programming that they put together for Black History Month. Um, and so uh, it was really amazing to see the kind of community that um, they've been able to uh, build uh, through the work uh, that they've been doing. Um, as black activists in the region. Um, and their activism is one in which, uh, which involves primarily creating spaces for uh, uh, the black, uh, black members uh, of the black residents of the Eastern townships uh, to gather, to um, celebrate things that are relevant to them, to discuss things that are relevant to their daily lives um, and to showcase the contributions of uh, local black artists and entrepreneurs entrepreneurs to the region. And um, there is a really, really amazing network of Black artists and entrepreneurs working in the Eastern Townships today. And so it's really uh, encouraging to see that um, there's momentum that's happening in terms of creating a vibrant uh, spaces, both virtual and physical, in which these communities can continue to be generated. Um, and so uh, in the exhibit, we see a turn at the end, at the end uh, towards, well, what does Black life look like in the Eastern Townships today? And what work are, are some members of its communities doing? Um, I th think one thing that's really remarkable is uh, so many of the people involved in this really, really important work um, uh, towards building Black community uh, spaces uh, in the townships are also women. Um, and they're doing uh, really, um, yeah, they're, they're women and their they're, they're projects are really overlapping, uh, overlapping with important feminist projects as well. Um, okay, so the other uh, aspect of the the uh, exhibit that I wanted to note uh, before we open up to discussion is that um, it, oh, actually, sorry, <laughs> I realized there are two more. So the first is I wanted, uh, I, wa I wanted the exhibit to be, um, to be a venue that brought together multiple perspectives. So one thing um, I did was I invited uh, five different academics and historians um, specializing on uh, Black Canadian history, Black or Black Quebec history uh, in particular to contribute text to the exhibit um, that are uh, relevant to their work and that connect to the Eastern Townships in Quebec. So um, through the texts and perspectives of these academics, uh, we're given, um, we're given uh, vistas onto uh, different uh, elements of Black history in Canada and Quebec. So we have uh, you know, Charmaine Nelson, who's writing about uh, the history of slavery in Quebec, and specifically the history, history of runaway slaves or freedom seekers, as they're more appropriately called. Um, we have Dorothy Williams, who's uh, one of the pioneers of uh, writing about uh, Quebec history, uh, Black Quebec history, uh, sharing a retrospective of her uh, of her life doing this this kind of research and the challenges that have come up with her for her along the way. Um, we have uh, Dr. Sean Mills, who uh, is a historian at the University of Toronto, who um, is writing about uh, changes in immigration policies um, and the changes uh, in um, uh, race-based immigration policies over the course of the 20th century that affected uh, the presence of Black people in Eastern townships directly. Um, and those are just a few of the, the academic and historical perspectives that are offered uh, to us by leading experts in different fields related to uh, Black Quebec and, and Canadian history. 
finally, I also wanted to, uh, I wanted to, there to be an artistic component to the exhibit. So we commissioned the work of two um, artists who just uh, completed a residency um, in Freelisburg, uh, where they were, uh, they were creating artistic responses to uh, Black oral histories in that region. So they spent a good part of last summer there doing this work. Their names are Anna Jane McIntyre and Emmanuel Jacques. Um, Emmanuel ended up producing a piece of art that is really, I find very moving and inspiring. Um, she's a print artist uh, by trade. And uh, what she did was she, uh, after doing research on the Black history of, of, of Freelisburg, um, she gathered together uh, some of the names uh, of, black, uh, of Black people that lived in the region. Uh, some of them included in the ledger uh, that Heather Darch also writes about that I showed an image of earlier. And uh, she created stamps uh, that are, the font was inspired by the US Declaration of Independence and using uh, their names uh, that have, were turned into stamps, she created the landscapes of Mount, Mount Pinnacle. So I'll just show you quickly what her, her, um, her end result ended up looking like. So here we get uh, uh, Emmanuel Jacques' piece, which she calls um, Freedom Pickers. Um, and then Emmanuel, and then Anna Jean McIntyre um, ended up uh, creating a crossroads sculpture um, that is mixed media and um, that is uh, a response. I, I could actually, I'll just, uh, maybe I'll end my, my part of this talk with a description of her, of her piece. Uh, the description that she wrote. So have I stopped sharing? Oh no, I haven't stopped sharing yet. Okay, sorry. Um, sorry, just one moment. Okay, so um, Anna Jane McIntyre's uh, mixed media sculpture, which she has titled uh, Tress, Mesh de Cheveux, um, uh, uses and here, sorry, I'm going to be describing the uh, the list that uh, McIntyre gives of the media that she used to create this piece. She writes a cedar fence post, antique nails, cement, hardware, paint, toy box, blood, sweat, tears, mixed emotions, ghost patina, stories, rumors, fragments of history, time. McIntyre's mixed media crossroads sculpture measuring seven feet tall and topped with a pool star set on wheels conjures a nomadic cedar, cedar tree, a tree considered a talisman of strength and resilience, particularly in turbulent times. Branches like choose your own adventure signposts point towards different paths to take. Tress, Mesh de Cheveux, asks viewers to listen very carefully. Its branches feature a small wind chime made of three antique, antique nails, similar to those gifted to her um, by Monique Dion, owner and caretaker of the United Church of Phillipsburg. The vitally important Eastern Township's Lake, Lake Champlain station stop on the Underground Rail, Railroad. Tress, Mesh de Cheveux, is the artist's response to the call, where do we go from here, chaos or community, posed by African-American social justice campaigner, Martin Luther King Jr. in his 1967 publication of the same name. So uh, uh, that's, that's the um, end of my presentation of the exhibit. What I'd like to just say about uh, moving forward is that this is far, very, very, very far from being a complete uh, comprehensive or total uh, account of Black histories in the townships that we've been able to uh, put together. Uh, it, I view it very much as a first step, a, a baby step really, in a much longer process of continuing to fill in the gaps um, in our um, historical memory in our collective memory of Black life in the Eastern Townships. And so the, the exhibit is really framed as a call for uh, participation um, as the beginning of a conversation, as a seed that we've planted, um, and as a, 
a call for people to to collaborate um, in 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 continuing to fill in the gaps in in these histories and learning about uh, the Black histories and present realities of of this region that many of us call home. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sunita. That's fabulous. And before we go to questions, I wondered if you could share some of the images from the exhibit. I, I, you, I've seen the exhibit uh, and some of them are gorgeous, like the, the woman, Eliza Rickard from Guadalupe, for example. And, and it would just allow people to have a visual of what the exhibit actually looks like. And then, uh, then we'll go to Glenn and he'll just explain a few things about asking questions. Sure. So can you, sir, can you see my screen okay, Heather? Uh, yeah. Yes, okay. yes, no problem. Okay. As I, I think, uh, showed... oh. I think it's uh, bigger if you press play. It's, um, we can see it, but I think it could just be a little bit bigger. You see that play button on the top? Yeah, I don't because it's currently blocked by my, by the uh, bar. By Zoom? Bar. Okay. So you have a suggestion <laughs> around that? I can't see. No, you. don't, it, it's fine. It's fine. I just, I, I oh, wait. previously, yeah, you got it. <laughs> okay. Just that much bigger. Thank you, Sunita. Um, okay, so we have the ledger that I discussed earlier. Here's an image uh, that I was referencing earlier of Martha. This comes from the Archive Boisfra in Victoriaville. And uh, as you can see, this is the Victorian clothing that I mentioned her wearing. Um, it's similar to the work, this photograph is similar to the work of a, a kind of famous early 20th century photographer named Notman. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a Notman photograph, um, but it was also kind of a standard, from what I understand, I'm not, a, I'm not a visual historian. I, I don't really know very much about photography, but from what I've been able to understand, um, this is a pretty common um, style of taking uh, professional photography at the time. And there were a lot of photographers uh, based in Montreal who would circulate around the regions um, taking photographs of bourgeois families. And in this case, it would seem that one of the bourgeois families in the Victoriaville area, we think, um, at least that's where the archive has been preserved, uh, or this part of the this archival uh, piece has been preserved. Um, it looks like they uh, they had a, a photograph of, of their family's uh, servant that that was taken here. Uh, we all we know is right as of now is that her name was Martha. But I I would really really love to figure out how to learn more about her. Um, this is a, a an image from the Record Museum of a early blackface uh, minstrel performance. Here we have um, My Myrie Sutton's International Jazz Band that uh, toured around uh, toured around Quebec. Um, here we have the first uh, all black uh, hockey line that uh, played in Sherbrooke in the 1950s with uh, Herb Carnegie, Ossie Car Carnegie, who were brothers and Manny McIntyre. Um, and here we have uh, the people, the women of one uh, contemporary Black activist uh, organization um, called Cher Noir that was founded just this last uh, year um, and that has really taken off um, um, in, the, in the past several months, actually. They've had quite a, a few um, online activities, especially for Black History Month. And these, uh, these women are uh, on the left, uh, Angélique gauguin couture and on the right, uh, Aïssé Touré, who are the co-founders of uh, the platform, uh, Instagram and Facebook. It started as an Instagram and Facebook, a platform called Black Estrie, uh, which is a, started as, as a virtual space for members of the Black community in the townships, uh, but now um, has all kinds of physical spaces uh, that it has generated. They're both uh, nurses by trade, so this is something that they do on their spare time. They're incredibly hard workers, <laughs> and they have done so. It's really amazing to see all of they, that they've been able to do. Um, in the short, the, the, this was founded uh, only a little uh, more than a year ago, Black Estrie, and, and already the following that they've been able to, to gain uh, and what they've been able to do is really, truly inspiring. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it for the images for now. I'm just gonna stop my share. No, that's great. And maybe Glenn, you could just uh, remind people how they can ask Sunita questions. Sure. Um, 
Yes, everyone, if you'd like to ask a question, um, the best ways to use the chat box, you can just say, I have a question, and then we'll queue you up and I'll unmute you and you can turn on your video. Um, or you can ask your question in the chat and uh, Heather or myself can deliver it on your behalf. Um, if you know where the raise hand button is in Zoom, you can use that too, that always works. And if you're on Facebook watching, I will do my best to check in over there to see if there are any questions and I'll deliver them on your behalf. Um, so uh, I, I guess I, I have a, a question, Sunita. Um, you were talking about the, the sort of dearth of print materials, um, what we normally consider archives, um, our archival materials relating to the Black history of the Eastern Townships. I'm wondering if, um, if it's possible to make any comment about the sort of living oral history um, in the region and, and if that extends back and includes um, part of the Black archive existing in this sort of oral form. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I, uh, I have a maybe very unconventional understanding of the archive, of the archive. I even use it as, you know, this kind of abstract idea. Um, I don't think about archives as just, you know, a, physical spaces that collect printed documents that you can go and visit. Um, I think of archives as um, all of the ways in which history gets transmitted down uh, to us. And so, or gets preserved and transmitted. Um, and that includes through the stories that we tell. So this includes oral histories. It includes uh, physical spaces that are built or created, sculptures that get, or get created, uh, places of uh, commemoration. Um, uh, recipes that get, down, get, get passed down from generation to generation, um, rituals, uh, traditions, customs, uh, ways of dressing, ways of speaking, um, all of these ways in which that are, uh, that are embodied, uh, right, that get passed down and that record histories, right? Um, and so I really don't think of the archive as just First of all, what is textual written down? I don't think that's a capacious enough way to think about how history actually gets passed down. Um, and uh, also that way of thinking about history really limits, uh, for example, in different periods of time, it's limited to people who have been literate, people who have at, had access to printing or to reading materials, which has been expensive. Um, and it limits uh, people who don't have the power to make their, uh, their stories uh, centralized in the culture in written form. Um, so the oral component is really important. Um, now we're in an era where we have a lot of technologies uh, that are widely disseminated and used for recording uh, oral histories. Um, and I think there's an opportunity uh, to record oral, oral histories uh, of Black life in the townships today, but I don't know who's, I'm having a lot of questions in the moment about whose role it is to do that. Uh, I know a lot of Black activists in the townships are already doing that on their own and in their own way. Um, and so, I, I have a lot of questions about, you know, the, the kind of the ethics, I guess, around recording those oral histories and what to do with them. So, um, but certainly I think that the stories that are being told currently and that will continue to get told uh, to posterity uh, about Black uh, uh, realities and contributions uh, and contributions in the townships are a very, very important part of uh, what we might call the Black archive of the region. Thank you. Heather, uh, would you have a question? And I also see Vicky has her hand up. No, it was, uh, I, I was almost going to ask almost the same thing, actually, Glenn, because, uh, well, you know, Sunita, that I've studied the, the Black community at Mississauga Bay and uh, that you've brought in a, uh, some oral history. And so I was wondering, is the oral history from a Black community that's maybe moved to Montreal or is it oral history from the community of St. Armand, Phillipsburg, some of the stories I've never heard of, for example, the story of ringing the church bell if there was a, a stranger in town uh, at, in order to protect the Black community that was there. And I thought that was an unusual story because Phillipsburg was actually a port. So there'd be strangers in town all the time. You know, goods right. went from La, went to La Prairie to Montreal and then down the Pike River was a 
huge lumber industry uh, and uh, down to the Hudson River. So I thought that was a story I've never heard of it, which doesn't mean it didn't happen, but it just uh, was like, oh, that's very interesting. So I wondered where the oral history comes from in in uh, in the in the exhibit and your research. Yeah, thank thanks for that question, um, I, Heather. I love the idea of like when you mentioned you know there were strangers coming through Phillipsburg all the time, like were the bells just constantly ringing? <laughs> <laughs> what did Phillipsburg sound like at that moment? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to have to get back to you on where exactly I, I heard, I because it's come up more than once. I have to go and pin down where I first started hearing about the oral histories. And I also think that my reference also comes from some printed material at this point that the printed histories are referencing the oral histories. So I'm going to go look through my materials and get back to you about where this, where this, um, this lore comes from and you know the other you raise another important question is like not like oral histories are interesting because they often tell us more about how something is being remembered uh than what actually happened in the first place right and we know that we know that there's um you know like the telephone game right like every time you repeat it, it can change a little bit. And that's part of how oral histories operate as living, breathing, dynamic, changing, transforming thing, phenomena, right? And so I think that we get into interesting questions about historic, historical authenticity and accuracy when we're dealing with oral histories. And so, but that does, that's not to say that I think uh, oral histories are not um, to be dismissed as historical material because whether or not they give us information about, you know, the facticity of something having, having happened, they do give us information about um, how at any given moment in time, a certain community is telling its own stories about itself, right? And that in itself, I find really interesting and value, valuable. No, that's that's an interesting point. Uh, I know the community has grappled with this history uh, for quite a while, uh, whether if there were actually enslaved people or not. I tend to, um, I lean on the side and you know this, of that the community was not actually, uh, if they were slaves, it wasn't for very long. And um, because, uh, well, in 18, 1800, the Reverend Caleb Cotton wrote that he, he had just come out of Savannah. So he was hoping, of course, there were people who would build a house for him. Uh, and he wrote that there was few black people in, in Phillipsburg and those that were, were free. So that's an interesting um, observation from someone who was very literate and very, he was very focused on his, um, on what his life was at the time and complained about everything, like what kind of tea he couldn't have. And so he very, very specific. So, right. so but, but over time, there's been this, this sort of, um, like an, like an oral history that's come out of Phillipsburg and, and, uh, but I, I wasn't sure if it was from the community uh, over time or if it was from a black history, uh, you know, if, because we assume the black community moved on to Montreal where there was a bigger community. But it's an interesting point you raise up about how a community tells stories over time, uh, not necessarily, and they're not necessarily correct, but they reflect uh, how people see themselves or saw themselves. So that's an interesting point to bring up. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll just add, Heather, that I did, I spent a couple of months living in Sutton last summer, last spring rather, and uh, I spent a fair bit of time in St. Armand. I was taking uh, pottery lessons there actually, so I would go there almost every day for a few months. And I, so I would, some of, some of the stories about the bells, I know that some of them do come from that period of time where I overheard them there. So, okay, um, but, it, but yeah, but the, that's all I, I wanted to add to that, but that's, uh, it's just interesting that that's something that's come up a number of times at this point. Well, it's, it's important to include oral history for sure, because, yeah. uh, you know, many, uh, you know, First Nations community, for example, yeah. use oral history more than the written text, right? And it's important to remember that and Black history, uh, Black history too will have that oral narrative as well. So yeah. now I have a, a, a interesting question for you. It's a bit hard. Uh, for Dr. Nigam, I'm observing this piece and I'm concerned about presentism in your work. We had several exchanges on Facebook 
And the reaction there was that there was almost no records because of the sizes of the population were almost negligible. Are you weaving a narrative of ones and twos? That's from Terry Warner. Yeah, so Terry, I think that one thing that's really, really important to remember, because this issue of, you know, I've heard a version of this uh, response like, oh, well, yeah, there may have been slaves in the townships or in Canada or in Quebec, but it was really nothing compared to the US. Okay, this is a narrative we hear, it's a reflex we hear again and again and again and again in the stories that we tell in Canada. It's a, almost a dominant reflex um, about slavery here. And of course, Canada really likes the narrative of us being this benevolent safe haven for you know, black slaves escaping the Underground Railroad. When you look more into the history of that, um, it's, it's not really that simple. Um, yes, uh, there were much lower numbers of enslaved people in Quebec than there were in the US and in Canada uh, and, in, and in, in the Eastern townships. One thing that's really, really important to remember is how hard Canada worked to keep black people out of this country from coming up from the US. Um, there were very, very restrictive uh, regulations around uh, Black movement into Canada. A lot of invasive and unnecessary medical exams were performed on Black people who, who tried to get into Canada. And uh, there were, uh, the, there were uh, many people sent from Canada to spread rumors about how unhospitable the climate in Canada would be for black, any Black people seeking to come here. So the question is, is, is it not incredibly interesting that given the such a low number of Black people that were in the region, so many of them were enslaved or servants? So yes, there were less, there were much fewer. We can't tell a story of volumes in the way that, that the US can tell, tell a story in volumes um, of their history of slavery. But we can tell a story of percentages, we can tell, and we can tell a story of, uh, of, uh, of keeping black people out. So isn't it interesting? And I do think this is interesting that out of, you know, we, given that there were so few people here, is it not interesting to see the kinds of conditions that they lived in and, uh, and uh, that they were not living in the same kinds of conditions by any stretch that uh, white people were? So that's my response to you. We have some questions. Um, let's see, we have one, Vicky, I think put her hand down, but Samuel, um, I'm gonna uh, ask you to start your video and I'll unmute you. Samuel, you're on. Wow, okay. I will, uh, what's up? I'm gonna keep my video off, it's okay. Sure. I have my, I'm, I'm indecent. <laughs> but I couldn't stand by, that was, a, that was just a hilarious, like, train of thought and I kind of found myself wondering um you know as the, the first thing that struck out to me was that there was so few like mention of black people in official archives to the point where we literally have to talk about minstrel shows as an awareness of even black people so we know black people like being, you know but it, I just wanted maybe to hear some comments about um uh, if this is like a, a chicken or like the chicken or egg situation that's been like proposed here about ones and twos like oh are we just like talking about only a very small negligible amount of black people or is it that like these stories never make the never make their way to the surface and people can have whole rich lives in eastern townships and in Canada that never get discussed because we don't like take the time to you know you know archive or it doesn't seem maybe necessarily important like how do those things like play off each other I wonder so this word has come up twice now I have a question for Samuel you and Terry what is a negligible amount of black people to you what does that mean a negligible amount of black people Terry, um, I'll, I'll unmute you. I see your hand raised. Um, I know you used the chat before, but, um, or I'll start with Samuel. Terry, if you want me to unmute you, just write in the chat. Samuel, over to you. Yeah, no, I just want 
Oh, you muted yourself, Samuel. Okay, well, I really didn't do that on purpose. Okay, so I, I really wanted to make my position clear. Like, I, as a Black person, find us left out of discussion all the time. And I would say that negligible amount is zero. Like, it's there is no negligible. Even if there's one person, that's what I was going to write in the comment. Even if there was one person that was Black and had an experience here, like, would we want, not, is that not worthy of, like, data collection like is that not what you know like i find i i don't want you to like give this kind of opinion too much time because i don't think it's particularly like you know i'm biased but like i think that the work you're doing is great i would have loved to i would love to see like images of black people more like seeing those black guys on the hockey rink like them's my cousins you know what i mean i'm like i'm really excited about like unearthing or like perhaps discovering these kind of stories so yeah thank i wanted to say thank you to you and to for 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 the work you guys are doing and i'm definitely going up and looking up all those people you mentioned like if you want to drop their links and stuff in the in the bio that would be dope too in the chat so yeah so thank you like seriously thank you i was looking forward to this talk for a long time so I'll, i'll let you i'll let it go no, Samuel, thank you so much. And thank you for your clarification. I'm with you. If there was not, if there were one or two people, black people in the townships, is that not, are, there, are those stories not worthy of being recounted and preserved? Like, I don't understand. It's like my, my brain can't compute that concept of a negligible amount of black people. I just can't compute. It's like someone talk, trying to tell me that the earth is flat. So I, I guess I don't have an answer to, to, to that uh, beyond that. And um, I will say, uh, Samuel, I also want to find more, you know, picture, more represent, it's like, I want, I think a lot of the, my personal motivation was like, I wanted to find more representation of Black people in the Eastern Townships. And I didn't find a lot of what I felt might have been really fascinating and interesting and inspiring to uncover. But um, I think what we don't know and what we don't find where it hasn't gone recorded can also be interesting. And, and then it asks questions about, well, where do we go from here, right? Um, because we're not done, we're living, we're living history right now and we have a future to look towards as well. So I'm, and in, in, uh, regarding uh, Terry's question also about presentism, which I didn't answer. Um, yes, I'm, I'm kind of unapologetically interested in history um, as a portal into the present. I'm not a historian by trade, and I'm only interested in history in terms of what it can teach us about the present moment. And that's my bias that I uh, have and that I am proud to have. <laughs> um, and I know a lot of historians won't, won't like me for that, and they have, their own, um, I, they have their own relationship to history. I'm interested in history for what it can teach us about the present and how it can help us move towards, towards a, a more inclusive and democratic futures. And that is... Uh, what interests me about uh, Black histories in this region. So, yeah. All right. Well, um, I promised that uh, Terry I would unmute him. So, Terry, I'm just going to, uh, let me see if I can figure this out. Hold on a second. Wait for it. <laughs> there we go. Terry, you're on. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Nigam, um, I, I giggled a little bit because the world is not is not flat. The world is very round. I'm a historian and I'm a geographer and uh, a son of the townships. Um, I use the word negligible not to deny the existence, but as a function of, uh, of um, I won't say accounting, but statistically. We could be discussing any population, any group, any movement, any phenomenon, uh, and and yet we find that there is just such such a lack of information. And I guess in the in the last couple of years, I've I've tried to learn more about Eastern Townships history, and what I've found is the people who came to the townships majority were coming from the United States. They arrived in a wilderness and it was hard, very hard living for these people. My own ancestor, Elam Warner, uh, operated rafts down the St. Francis River as a way of moving cargo. 
And that was hard labor. People drowned in the, uh, in the rapids. So um, you, I'm glad you mentioned the point about literacy and the glad you mentioned the point about record keeping because there is not a lot of information at all. And so we could be talking about red haired Irishmen with just the same amount of intention of, of intensity or Russian speaking settlers too. There's, You've, you've picked a particularly topical question, which is one that has a lot of attention. And um, you also disclosed your bias. You said that you are a present day, non, not a historian. So uh, I'm reluctant to accept a lot of the premises because you're pulling story elements from not from history but from information which supports your bias so that's that's my that's my comment and that's why i call it presentism so thank you uh, glenn so i want to say a couple of things in response to this um the um I don't know what it means to say that i'm pulling things not from history i am pulling things from history so I may be not pulling the things that you would like to see me pull from history, but I also want to say that um, it would be a mistake to assume that um, other historians, unlike me, don't have their own biases. And one thing that we know very clearly at this point is that the official histories that have come down to us about Quebec and Canada and the Eastern Townships, especially in relation to Indigenous peoples, uh, Black people, and uh, other racialized communities, reflect a very strong bias towards representing white Canadian histories. Okay, so that's number one. So when I um, I'm saying, yeah, I'm going to spend some time now focusing on Black histories because, because of the bias that currently exists and is dominant in the way official histories are told, these histories have not been represented adequately. I'm saying, well, no, it's not the same thing. I, I, it's not, you know, I'm not interested in telling another story about a white Irish person. We have a lot of those stories already. So where is, uh, where is the room for us to talk about black histories, right? If the question is, well, why, if every time the question is, why aren't you telling us more uh, white histories with equal interest and, and passion and intensity? Well, we've been asking that question for a long time and the histories that we've been coming up with for a long time have been representing a predominantly white bias in the way that we tell histories. And I'm not gonna do that anymore. I'm not gonna participate that in that anymore. We have a, thank you for that, Sunita. Um, we have a, a couple more questions. I see some hands up. Um, Chris Judd uh, has had his hand up for a while. Chris, I'm just gonna unmute you. Chris, what's on your mind? Just wonder if you, if you had ever read about London Oxford. He was the first pre-black person in Ottawa Valley. He came north with uh, Tillman Wright in the year 1800. He lived on the north side of the Ottawa River at, at uh, Wrightville, Quebec, which is now called Gatineau. He was a very okay. uh, a personal friend of uh, Tillman Wright. You say his name is London Oxford? Yes. I haven't, but thank you so much for this tip. I'm going to find out more about him now. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And the very first square timber raft went down the Ottawa River in the year 1806. He was on the raft. And he was on the what? Sorry. A very first square timber raft that went down okay. the Ottawa River. He helped okay. to build it and he was on it. He was on it down the river in 1806. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank Overall. you, Chris. Always nice to see you. Um, Sandra Stock, um, I'm going to unmute you. Sandra, what's on your mind? Oh, okay. Uh, Sunita, I really enjoyed your presentation, the information. I'd like to follow it up and go to uh, see what I can find also about 
with the work you've done. Um, what I want to say about history in general is the way people have written history way back from the classical world um, has always reflected the society that we're writing in. And until very recently, our society here has not been particularly democratic. People like working class people, women, Minority groups, indigenous people, and so on, were um, often not necessarily demonized, but they were excluded in the way they were excluded from society's uh, power bases in general. Um, there has been a slow, gradual change to that. Um, and also a lot more interest in local history, like histories of the Eastern Townships or the Laurentians, where I wrote a lot of local history in a small way. Um, so it, you're sort of on the crest of the wave to bring more democracy and also more interest and information. Um, the reason so many students find history boring is because it's all about constitutions and, and wars and so on. They want to hear about people. And they also want to see people like them and people like their neighbors reflected in the history that they're being taught and reading about. So I agree with you with what you're calling presentism. I think that's fine because the purpose of history isn't the past. The purpose of history is the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. I love that. I love what you said. I'm going to quote you on that in the future. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Sandra. I'm going to meet you now. Sunita, I thought it's, I, I love how the exhibit covered so many different aspects, including sports. And I don't know if you've followed through uh, with baseball uh, or not uh, in the townships, because baseball was incredibly popular. There's still uh, some leagues that have been playing, um, you know, since the 1920s. They're still playing today. And I believe one of the first, if not the first, Black man to play uh, baseball in the minor leagues was in the townships and uh, his he played for the Granby Red Sox and his name was uh, Alfred Wilson in 1935 and uh, they, they weren't black uh, leagues or negro leagues as they were called in the states but they were uh, leagues that needed more players and good players so they got uh, baseball players from the teenagers, mostly from the from the, the United States. And they came up here and played in the baseball leagues in the townships. And a lot of the cities, the towns like Stanbridge East, uh, Granby, Sherbrooke, uh, uh, Farnham, the Farnham Pirates, they had black players. And uh, you have to really look into the past to find the black histories don't you you have to that's why um in the one article I, I wrote about Flavia it's how do you see her you have to look in the history ledgers and in the store ledgers in Mrs. Squabe they you know it's, it's so often that you just see it on the notation on the side margin black man uh has purchased something you know and it, they weren't given a name but they were there right there in the history and so you have to look so hard to find them but the stories are there so I think it's wonderful you've uncovered so many stories, even uh, reflecting on the black minstrel uh, groups that traveled, they were, like you said, reflecting what they saw in society or hoping they what they saw. I'm not sure, but uh, it's it's quite something. And I know that Missisquam Museum has a double base uh, that was used uh, down at the Frontier Hotel, which was located in Pigeon Hill. And they were all blackface uh, uh, men from the community that played down there. So. Uh, very much a, a presence in, in this part of the townships too. Thank you so much for that, Heather. Um, we should, we should, we should co-write something on black baseball <laughs> townships. You, you, yes. you know, yeah, I, would, I would love to co-write something with you at some point if you're interested, but um, we, uh, yeah, I don't, so I would say in general, my knowledge about sports is very, very thin. <laughs> 
but um, <laughs> and uh, so our our athletic uh, kind of focus in the exhibit it's really Andy Holman that's brought it to the exhibit and that's why I was like Andy can you just please you know about this please can you write about black sport for this exhibit um, but absolutely yeah, you're right that it was uh, base especially baseball uh, hockey and and boxing right where we saw a, a lot of black performers coming through the township sometimes just for a season or a game uh, but they were coming through here um, and I admit like I haven't done I haven't dug there but that's definitely an avenue for further research there's there's something there to be written about because we do have uh, like unlike some other um, moments in the Black history of the region, that's something where we do have some material to work with. Um, and so it would be a really interesting um, contribution to, to, to continue digging more into that history and to producing uh, some kind of text or something out of it. So anyway, sure. well, I'm going to be back in touch with you. We'll about talk. That. We'll yeah. talk. <laughs> I see uh, Sam any, uh... Samuel's oh. hand is up. So okay, go. Samuel, I'm going to pass it back to you. Let me just unmute you there. Okay, you're on. Yeah, just wanted to, um, I know we're probably like pressed for time, but um, thank you to Sandra for saying everything I wanted to say, but way more eloquently. Um, I also wanted to just mention that there were, there's usually like three places where we talk about Black people, um, right? It's like from, you know, in, when we're looking at like archival stuff, I would imagine like three places where black people can be really like free or at least like on the same level is sports. Um, you know, like there's obviously like they're, they're like the work, like literally being in the field and having the knowledge. And then um, I would say church or like um, religion and things like that. So I noticed that, that there, during this talk, we didn't really talk about religion. Um, and like you said, there's way more things to go into. This is like, this is there's there's more work to be done but yeah just wondering if you had any thoughts on 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 black people congregating maybe in the eastern township samuel that's such a such a great and important question so thank you so much for that i have done embarrassingly little uh research on that i i i've tried a little bit and and every time i've tried i've just i haven't found enough and then I got deterred and I decided to focus on other things for this particular uh, exhibit. But certainly uh, church, church records or something I'm really, really interested in, in exploring because you're absolutely right. Um, and even through oral history, I've learned about in North Hatley, in the town of North Hatley, where I'm from, um, this is one of the places where uh, American uh, people from the American South would come in the summer and bring black servants with them. Through oral histories, I've learned that they would go to church, uh, these, these servants, and there were specific churches. I think it was the Baptist church in North Hatley. Um, and um, what was I gonna say? Uh, I, I, there's more to be found out there, um, but I haven't seriously done that research yet. Uh, and I imagine Heather would probably know more than I do, but I would imagine there's there's quite a few to, documents to go through in terms of church records, right? Um, but yeah, thank you for that. Because I think you're right. Like the spaces, I, you mentioned, um, I love the way you thought about, the way you framed that, Samuel, was really useful. Like the way, the three kind of places, almost the geography of where black people appear in archives, right? Or in, in, in newspaper, in the media, in archi or in archives, right? So we have sports, you mentioned labor, hard labor in particular, and then the church. And then I would also add music, right? And that's where we see that happening um, in, in, with the jazz uh, performers. But yeah, the spaces where they were congregating, super important, and th that definitely was happening. And um, Thank you. Yeah, that's something that's really worthwhile to continue to pursue for the future. Uh, Jen, thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't know if there's any more questions. I'm thinking that we probably uh, allow our guest speakers to go now. <laughs> it's been a marvelous time. Uh, and thank you so much, Sunita. You've, you've uh, I think, you know, you've only just started to scratch the surface. We all really have. There's there's a lot of history out there. The Black community was here and it's finding them and where they were. And that was that's quite brilliant, Samuel, to bring that up because uh, were there churches? Uh, were they involved in 
white churches I'm not sure you know and where were they in sports and where uh, where were the women and you know it's, we're just all these questions we're just starting to ask and so it's really quite marvelous that uh, that you've started to to bring this to us and it, a, a great project from the Eastern Townships Resource Centre and I'm sure Fabian has been uh, uh, is, is quite delighted that uh, you have been involved in in opening up the archives uh, and asking for people to please donate, I'm sure, to the ETRC, any information that they do have and growing archives uh, of this sort, you know, and uh, whether it's oral histories or it's music or what have you. And so I think you've really uh, cracked a door open for everybody and it's it's quite marvelous. Um, right. And I, I think you, maybe... Uh, for sure. And I, I think maybe you did already share the link to the online exhibit. Yes. Uh, so it's uh, black-histories.com, um, available in English and French. And the exhibition, uh, the panel outdoor exhibition will be available on the Bishop's University campus till March 18. And after that, uh, we, we intend to borrow it to other historical associations or societies in the region. It will go to Richmond in, in the summer. But if you're involved with, <clears throat> with any his, history group in the Eastern Townships and you would like to, to have this exhibition for free, uh, you're welcome to, to contact me and we discuss further details. Yeah, that's super. Thank you. Well, I'll... I'll end our time then today and think thank you to both you Fabian uh, at the ETRC and to you Sunita Nigam. Thank you so much for your presentations. Thought provoking, it's challenging, it's, uh, uh, it's you've opened this wonderful study to us uh, that all the people in the townships and from beyond can, can start looking and seeing black people and the black contributions to this part of the, the townships. And uh, so thank you so much for your time today. Um, thank you thank for you. having me, uh, Heather. Thank you, Taquan. Uh, my pleasure. And we'll be in touch again, I'm sure, because we both have a passion for, for finding people in the past yeah. and, uh, so, and hearing their voices. And so this is going to be wonderful. And I know there's many people in the Quan network. You've met some of them today, and Vicky and Sandra and Samuel. And uh, they're out there uh, with questions, with challenges like Terry had for you. And, and it's all good. It's all uh, part of the conversation and, and getting people to, to really think and think hard about what we're doing uh, in, in the study of history in our past. So thank you so much. Um, if you're interested, we have our next talk is on Tuesday. It's coming up really quick. This Tuesday, we're going to be speaking with Janice Rosen from the Alex Dworkin Canadian Jewish Archives. And her talk is called From Ship to Shoebox, Exploring Quebec Jewish History Through the Canadian Jewish Archives. So that's Tuesday, March 1st at 7 p.m. right here on Heritage Talks Live. Uh, thank you again, uh, to everyone. And if you want to see this presentation, uh, go back to see it and review it. You can go to our uh, Facebook page, Heritage Talks Facebook page. Um, and if you want to see the up and coming uh, uh, talks to come, you can go there as well. So thank you again to you both. Thank you to our audience and uh, have a great afternoon. Bye for now. Bye, everyone. <laughs>